Hello there, and welcome to the Macroeconomics Speed Round, your guide to not failing this part of the course. Let's get started. Macroeconomics is economy on a grand scale. This deals with the wealth of entire nations as opposed to just households. A key element is observing a nation's income or economic well-being. This can be done using the GDP or gross domestic product. GDP can be defined as the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. It is calculated by combining four elements, household consumption of the goods and services, investments, government purchasing, including employing civil servants and public works like education, and exports to other nations. Combining all these, we see the nominal GDP. However, this system doesn't address a key element of economies all over the world, constant changes in monetary value. This explains why back in the day you could see a movie for 10 cents, where now you have to spend half your student loans to see Interstellar. The key element is real GDP. This takes into account inflation and currency changes in its calculation, giving us a universal number. Where nominal is valued at current prices, real is valued at constant prices. A change from nominal to real can be done using a GDP deflator. Some issues with GDP as a unit of measurement is that it fails to account for income inequality or environmental concerns, leading to potentially misleading stats. Next up is calculating cost of living. This is done using a consumer price index, or CPI. It measures the cost of typical goods and compares it to that of a base year. This shows how much the cost of ordinary goods are changing. For example, if a loaf of bread costs 97 cents in January 2007, and now costs a dollar and three cents, you would calculate the CPI by doing this. This means we can see the inflation rate. Some issues, among other things, with this system is that it fails to show substitutes for products. It being just an overview, it tends to overstate the inflation by failing to account for many variables. You may be thinking that both the CPI and the GDP deflator are pretty much the same, and uh, yeah, you'd probably be right. The only differences are that the CPI calculates imported goods and maintains a fixed basket of goods for their readings, where the GDP deflator only acknowledges goods and services from the nation, and the variables are constantly changing over time as the goods produced change. Inflation is combated by price indices created by law and contracts. This helps to maintain the integrity of interest rates because the value of money will change over time. Just like GDP, the nominal interest rate fails to account for inflation, where real accounts for that inflation. We can calculate real interest rates by subtracting nominal from the rate of inflation. Where the nominal interest rate or money interest rate is the typically reported one, the real interest rate is the one that takes into account the value changes over time. It is the percentage increase in money you pay the lender for the use of money. Economic growth varies in any country. Sometimes there are periods of strong growth, other times growth is slower. Over time, a trend can be established. Trend growth is found using a simple formula. GDP at a given time period is taken, and GDP from an earlier time period is subtracted from it. The result is divided by GDP of the initial time period. This gives the trend growth rate over that period. Productivity refers to the quantity of goods and services that a worker can produce for each hour of work. Productivity is the key determinant of living standards. A nation can enjoy a high standard of living only if it can produce a large quantity of goods and services. One of the ten principles of economics by Mankiw is that a country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. Many factors determine productivity. They are physical capital, human capital, natural resources, and technological knowledge. Physical capital is the stock of equipment and structures that are used to produce goods and services. Capital is a factor of production used to produce all kinds of goods and services, including more capital. Examples of physical capital include roads and buildings. Economics define human capital as the knowledge and skills that workers acquire through education, training and experience. Human capital raises a nation's ability to produce goods and services. Natural resources are inputs into production that are provided by nature. These include land, rivers and mineral deposits. Natural resources take two forms. 
There are renewable sources such as forests where a tree is planted to be harvested after one tree is cut down. There are also non-renewable resources such as oil. Although natural resources can be important, they are not necessary for an economy to be highly productive. Some economies use trade as a substitute. A great example is Japan. They import many of the natural resources needed, such as oil. Technological knowledge is the understanding of the best way to produce goods and services. It is the application of knowledge to the environment to enable people to exercise greater control over that environment. The function is used to describe the relationship between the quantity of inputs and outputs in production. Y is the quantity of output. L is the quantity of labor, while K is the quantity of physical capital, H is the human capital, and N is the quantity of natural resources. Production and growth is all well and good, but a big question faced by entrepreneurs and governments is how it is financed. This is where the financial system comes into play. The financial system is a massive part of the economy. The main aim of the financial system is to match one person's savings with another's investment. In other words, it moves an economy's scarce resources from savers to borrowers. The financial system is made up of two different categories, financial markets and financial intermediaries. Financial markets include the stock market and bond market, here people to directly invest in companies. Financial intermediaries include banks and mutual funds. This is where people indirectly invest in companies in the form of deposits in a bank. These are loaned to people and companies. A bond is a certificate of indebtedness that specifies obligations of the borrower to the holder of the bond. A bond has a certain length of time until it matures. A bond holder receives investment payments on the principal similar to a mortgage. Bonds are rated on the probability that the borrower will fail to pay the monthly interest or principal. This rating is called credit risk. Companies with a high credit risk will pay a higher interest rate. The interest on bonds is taxable and that can affect the price of a bond. The stock market is where people buy a portion of a company and therefore can claim to the profits that the firm makes. This is called equity financing. Stocks pose a higher risk and as a result, higher potential returns. There are many things which can affect demand for shares, such as price, volume, market capital, dividend and price to earnings ratio. The price of a stock is what you must pay to own a part of the company. Volume is the total number of shares sold. Market capital is volume multiplied by the price of the share. A dividend of the share is profits paid to stockholders. The price to earnings ratio is the price of a share divided by earnings per share. Banks take deposits from people who want to save and use the deposits to make loans to people who want to borrow. Banks pay depositors interest on their deposits and charge borrowers a slightly higher interest on their loans. Banks help create mediums of exchange such as credit cards, checks, bank transfers, etc. Along with this, banks can create credit, increasing the amount of money in, a, in an economy. A mutual fund is an institution that sells shares to the public with the money it raises from the shares. They invest in a select portfolio of shares or bonds and they allow people with small amounts of money to diversify their investment. Savings and investment make up part of national income. In an economy in equilibrium, savings will equal investment. There are two different types of savings. Private savings, which is income minus tax minus total consumption, and public savings, which is tax minus government expenditure. If tax is greater than government expenditure, there will be a budget surplus. If government expenditure is greater than tax, the government will be running a budget deficit. Loanable funds refers to the people who have chosen to save rather than use their money for their own consumption. Supply of loanable funds comes from people who have extra income they want to save. 
The demand for loanable funds comes from households and firms that wish to borrow and make investments. The intersection of the supply and demand for loanable funds is the interest rate. It is the cost of borrowing money. The government plays a large role in investment. If the government increase taxes on savings, there will be an inward shift in the supply of loanable funds. An increase in taxes on savings decreases the incentive for someone to save. A decrease in the tax on savings will cause an outward shift in the loanable fund supply curve. The government can issue an investment tax credit, which increases incentive to borrow. This will cause an outward shift in the loanable fund's demand curve. This will increase the interest rate and quantity saved. The government budget also affects investment and savings. If the government run a budget deficit, there will be less money for people to borrow. This is called crowding out. There will be an inward shift in the loanable fund supply curve and the resultant increase in the equilibrium interest rate and a reduction in the equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. A budget surplus increases the supply of loanable funds and as such reduces the interest rates and stimulates investment. Well, folks, we've come to the end of the topic. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you do well on your test. Thanks for listening and best of luck.